In 1996, Capcom made history with Resident Evil. Its creation led to a whole bunch of other survival horror titles coming out that often tried to use similar styles of gameplay. This went on a lot during the PlayStation 1 and 2 era, but only a few managed to reach the same levels of popularity as Resident Evil did. The same year that Resident Evil released, Konami put a team together in order to make a survival horror game, and by put together, I mean they just threw random people in random job positions. Namely, Keichiro Toyama, who literally had no idea why he was given the job of director, especially considering he had no experience with horror films. Regardless, they all made do with what they had. People like Konami requested that they make a horror game in line with Hollywood films, and with all of that being said, Silent Hill was created. As I was replaying Silent Hill for this video, I found a completely new appreciation for the game. My views on the game has changed a lot over the years, and I originally went from absolutely loving it to disliking it a ton. But after replaying it, I think it aged quite well. There's a lot of design choices that might bother a ton of people, but I personally enjoyed it. The game opens on a cutscene that pretty much summarizes the entire main synopsis. You play as Harry Mason, a man who's on his way to Silent Hill with his daughter Cheryl for vacation. He eventually gets into a car accident after he slams his brakes because of a person in the middle of the road. Firstly, a huge thing that people might view as inaccessible to players today is the tank controls. Like most survival horror games of the time, and even games preceding, the game uses a control scheme where moving up on the d-pad moves the character forward in the way they're directing. Down moves your backwards and left and right turns the player. It's a control scheme that a lot of people hate, but I'm personally a huge defender of tank controls. The reason being, if the game has fixed camera angles, the control scheme would fit with the camera design. You could argue fixed camera angles are bad, but they're really effective in games like this when it comes to being unnerving, and Silent Hill is a perfect example of that. If the game didn't have tank controls and instead used analog controls, it would most likely be hard to to navigate. Later entries in the Silent Hill series prove my point on how it could or could not be hard to navigate with the lack of tank controls. I'd say 4 handles it quite well as the combat is more of the focus this time around, but then there's Origins which controls like absolute fucking dog shit. It's so hard to point in the right direction in that game with the amount of random camera changes. I understand that people don't like tank controls, which is fair, but you're watching a video by a person who defends System Shock 1's controls. Even then, you have to admit that the control scheme works with this type of camera system and that's all that really matters. The way Silent Hill 1 uses fixed camera angles is actually very impressive. A lot of games at the time had often used pre-rendered backgrounds. Even around the release of this game, other survival horror titles were still using pre-rendered backgrounds. Those have always been a bit of an issue for me. Pre-rendered backgrounds are fine, but they always bug me because I always felt they made things a little hard to see, like, like, does that even make sense? Like, a small part of why I personally bounce off early Resident Evil is due to the fixed camera angles and how everything but the items and the character models are pre-rendered. I always felt it made things a little hard to move around in, but Silent Hill is entirely 3D. This not only opens up the possibility of a moving camera and also an easier way to experiment with shots and angles, Silent Hill does in fact do this. Uh, anyway, let's get into the actual game here. The first thing you do in this game is chase Cheryl into an alley. This part of the game always stuck out to me, as it has some of the coolest camera angles of the entire series. As you move toward the goal, the camera swings around. It's pretty cool. Making it to the goal leads to Harry getting attacked by some enemies, only to collapse and wake up in a diner. This is where you meet Sybil. You're probably going to notice almost immediately the voice acting is awful. The later games in the series use awkward voice acting with the goal of making things feel uncomfortable, which in those games I'd definitely say it works, but it doesn't really work in the first game, honestly. Oh, like I've been run over by a truck. But I'm all right. This part of the game pretty much gives you all the essential items as well as your first combat introduction. I like Silent Hill's combat, at least the gun combat. An enemy named the Air Screamer breaks through a window where you have to fight it. The radio is introduced in this part and it's a very iconic item in the series and it's a very unique mechanic. However, the radio sounds silly in the first game. <laughs> It's more like a soft ringing than a radio sound, but later games change the sound to be more like a radio, or they don't have a radio at all. Enemy variety isn't very good in my opinion, the air screamers are annoying as shit, later on there's really obnoxious monkey enemies, but the enemies within levels are actually pretty interesting. For example, the elementary school introduces grey children. Those enemies always rub me the wrong way. They move in such strange ways and are holding knives. 
Overall, the enemies are easy to deal with even if it's quite disturbing to attack them considering they are childlike. The way health operates in this game is a lot like early Resident Evil as to be expected, though instead of green herbs that can be combined with other types of herbs, you are given health drinks and medkits. There's an even stronger health item too called Ampule. These pretty much boost your health to the max. You can tell what your health is by looking at the character profile icon on the upper left of the inventory menu. The inventory itself is pretty different from Resident Evil and a lot of other survival horror titles of the time. Instead of having an item limit, you are allowed to hold whatever can be found. There is no item boxes like Resident Evil or anything. I personally have mixed opinions on the style of inventory when it comes to survival horror. Like it's nothing I would really complain about, but it definitely lessens the survival horror aspect. In other survival horror games with an item limit, there's a layer of tension when it comes to certain situations. I feel like Resident Evil definitely does this well. There's times in that game where I decide to put my weapons in the box so I could just quickly run into a puzzle. This sometimes puts me in a bad situation where I most likely die. I always felt that it added to the experience. I definitely say the lack of a limited inventory is not the worst in this game or in the other titles, at least until Origins. <laughs> but it kind of lessens an aspect in survival horror that I generally love. Regardless, it's fine. The way levels are laid out in Silent Hill 1 is pretty interesting. It's separated into three different sections, basically. You explore the town, and then explore a building. Within these buildings, there's usually an Otherworld section, which are usually more puzzle-focused than the other sections. The levels you explore are an elementary school, a hospital, and a very fucked-up combination of pretty much every level you've been in. The puzzles in these levels are pretty interesting, though I know a lot of people are pretty against how cryptic some of them can be, and I completely get why. For example, there's a puzzle in the school level. Your main goal is to collect two different different medallions in order to make it to the school's other world section. Essentially, you have to read a line of poetry to figure out the correct order of keys that need to be pressed on a piano. This section really troubles a lot of people, which I completely understand, and I was in the same boat when I first played the game, but it was still fun for me to solve at the time because my mom had helped me out on the puzzle. Good times. <laughs> The story and characters in this game are all pretty interesting. I'm personally not that big on stories revolving around cults, but this game is fine. Later games definitely do these themes worse, namely Homecoming. Silent Hill 1's story is probably the least complex of the original four, as mentioned before. It follows Harry Mason, who takes his daughter to Silent Hill, a vacation town that is seemingly abandoned when they get there. After getting into the car accident, Cheryl seems to be missing, so the main goal is for Harry to find his daughter. Along the way, he meets the aforementioned Sybil, a policewoman who also seems to have crashed into town. She's a very unique character, and she plays a big part in the ending depending on a very specific thing you do in the hospital. After the school level, Harry hears the sound of a church bell ringing, a woman named Dahlia Gillespie is the one who is ringing it, and she's pretty much the main antagonist of the game. When you get to the hospital, things become a bit more clear as that is the exact point you are introduced to Alessa Gillespie properly. You find a picture of her in a room in the basement. This is her hospital room. In that hospital, you meet Lisa Garland and Michael Kaufman. This is probably a good time to bring up the Twin Peaks influence. Much like Twin Peaks, Silent Hill has a large amount of characters that each have their own subplots and problems. Twin Peaks influence is running throughout the entire game. The entire town of Silent Hill is very obviously influenced by Twin Peaks. And also, no, it isn't based on fucking Centralia, that is the movie. Anyway, Lisa is probably the most interesting of the two. Kaufman is fine as a character, but I never found him that interesting. Sure, he's mysterious and shady, and I do like that, but Lisa's story is genuinely tragic, and I always found that more interesting to follow rather than Kaufman. She's a woman who is just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's later revealed that Lisa was addicted to drugs. Not only that, but she is involved in the main plot because she was the nurse of Alessa Gillespie, who is obviously Dahlia's daughter. Dahlia planned to use Alessa in order to gain power by making her birth god. During the game, she paints Alessa as the true antagonist when it's really her. During the school level and also the hospital level, you learn more about Alessa and what she went through. When she was in school, she was bullied, and at some point she was in a house fire caused by Dahlia where she was burnt to a crisp. But she didn't die. She was forced to live in a hospital in a very vegetated state until Dahlia's plan came to a close. Now, the reason Harry is involved in all of this is because Cheryl is actually another part of Alessa. I actually don't really remember how that happened, and I refuse to acknowledge Origins as canon, but yeah, it's a thing. And the reason Harry and Cheryl went to Silent Hill is because Cheryl really wanted to go. Depending on what you do before the ending, things can go very differently. 
During the hospital, you can find an empty bottle in the kitchen. In one of the rooms, you can find a puddle of red liquid, and the game doesn't even tell you it's possible to do, but using the empty bottle on the puddle lets you scoop it up for future use. Later on, during one of the last sections of the game, you can begin a side quest in which you find Kaufman being attacked. The subplot ends with Harry discovering a bottle of the mysterious red liquid. Upon discovering it, a cutscene starts where Kaufman comes in and takes it from Harry. During a fight with Sybil, if you walk up to her without shooting and then use the bottle you filled up previously, she will be saved. If both of these side quests are completed, then you are getting the best ending by default. During the batshit insane final level, you have to go through a bunch of confusing corridors and segments. It's like each previous level stitched together. It's neat. One of the most important things in this level is Lisa Garland's scene. You run into her after picking up a key item, and she is acting very strange. Harry pushes her away, and she hits onto the wall, and she begins to gush blood before collapsing. Harry leaves the room. You can re-enter this room and find her diary on the floor where it is revealed that she really wanted to quit her job and just get away from Alessa. She began hallucinating as well due to the drug usage and possibly Alessa's powers, I'm not so sure. For the sake of this video, we'll only go over the good plus ending because it is the canon one. After you make it through the final level of the game, which is fucking insane by the way, you run into Dahlia and Alessa, and I think Cheryl too, but I'm not entirely sure at this point. Sybil arrives and gets thrown back when she tries to attack Dahlia. That's when Harry shows up and she begins to go off about how Alessa was kept alive so that Dahlia could gain power. And then our boy Kaufman shows up with the red liquid named Aglothitis. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Kaufman fucking shoots her and it's really funny. Like, like he just kind of shows up and shoots her, I guess. So he throws the Aglothitis at Alessa who is in the middle of transforming. And then that's when shit gets pretty fucking insane. So Alessa falls down and a giant entity named Samael comes out of her. This is the final boss. Now would be a great time to bring up the soundtrack. The soundtrack was composed by Akira Yamaoka, and his themes for this game fit fucking perfectly with it. Silent Hill's soundtrack is comprised of metallic and industrial ambience that doesn't really have a melody at all. They're usually very chaotic. Yamaoka is the composer for most of the series, and the themes he makes get better as the series goes on. During the final fight, the theme that plays is the most unnerving. It's a theme that has the sound of drills while more metallic clanging plays alongside it. It's legitimately disturbing and makes the fight more intense. I think the final fight overall is okay, I don't entirely know how it works, but I usually get through it easier if I pause the game and reload in the inventory, rather than going through an animation that'll waste time. Completing the fight will result in a final cutscene in which Alessa comes back and hands Harry a baby, and then she points Harry into the direction of a light. Kaufman tries to make an escape, but is then pulled into a pit by Lisa. I really don't know how the fuck she managed to get there, because I assume there's nothing underneath the rusty grating. Harry and Sybil run off into the light with the baby and make it out. The credits begin to roll. After the credits, Harry and Sybil are shown in a graveyard with that baby. I wonder if that baby will grow up to be a badass and totally the best Silent Hill protagonist. Silent Hill 1 is an okay game, in my opinion. I feel like I've changed my take on it a lot over the years. When I played it for this video, I found myself enjoying it more than I had any time beforehand, but it is still riddled with very small issues. I really love a lot of things this game does, but later titles in the series definitely improve on a lot of things. I don't know when I will talk about those games, but hopefully soon. After Silent Hill 1 was released, Keichiro Toyama left Konami.
Siren is a very different game from Silent Hill. The first Silent Hill was a very direct game. Apart from having some of the lore veiled until a certain point, it was pretty straightforward. Siren, on the other hand, tells a story in a completely non-linear way, to the point where I'm not even sure I can fully summarize it. On top of that, the setting, gameplay, and characters are all completely unique as well. Rather than having an American town setting, it's a rural Japanese village. I really enjoy the setting, maybe even more so than Silent Hill. I'm a big fan of horror in Japan settings, and if you know me at all, you know that my favorite horror franchise is Fatal Frame partly because of this reason. Compared to Silent Hill, I'd definitely argue that Siren is the scarier of the two. A big reason why is because of the main mechanic, sight jacking. Sight jacking is basically when you hold L2 and you can tilt the left analog stick to see through the eyes of an enemy. You're able to map the eyes you are looking through on the four face buttons as a quick way to look back at them when needed. It's an easy way to keep track of where they are. Apart from sight jacking, the soundtrack is another part of why I think it's scarier than Silent Hill. Some of these tracks, man. When I was younger, I had originally dropped this game because of the Karuwari theme. I did that a lot with games I played when I was like 10. But yeah, the soundtrack here is fucking great. I wouldn't put it above any of Akira Yamaoka's work, but it definitely gets the job done perfectly. Lastly, the facial animation in this game is very discomforting. I don't really know if it's intentional or not, but it's just so fucking uncanny and I love it. The way the enemies look is just so eerie, but even the main characters as well. It somehow works pretty well. The game follows 10 different characters across many different points in time during the game's main story. The way the story is conveyed is by showing a sort of Google Sheets or Excel type screen where the game automatically sends you to the stages. The first person you play as, and the person I'd call the main protagonist, is Kiyosuda. The first thing you do when playing as him is run away from a police officer after spotting a mysterious ritual. You are spotted, but during this point in time you probably don't know why until the second time you play as him. The enemies in this game are called Shibito. They're pretty much zombies, but if they still maintain their original thoughts and such. There's a couple different types, but I must admit, I find the basic ones to be the most discomforting. I know a lot of people disagree, but I really like them. By far the worst enemies in this game, at least to me, are the really fucking annoying rifle Shibito. They are easy to avoid, but they can kill you with like two shots. Guns in this game all kind of operate like this. They all usually down you or enemies in one to two shots. It adds challenge, and I don't particularly mind it. A thing this game got a lot of shit for was the difficulty. This game is very hard, but that's partly what I love about it. Silent Hill is always going to be a pretty easy game no matter what difficulty setting you're on, but Siren on the other hand being as difficult as it is leaves room for strategy. This is part of the game that I always really liked. A good example is the first level you play as Akira Shimura, a 70 year old man who has a rifle. That level stumped me the first time I played it, but man, now it's so fun to strategize on that level in particular. Coming up with exactly what I should do and who I should take out first was just so fun. The amount of really smart decision making this game encourages you to do is a big part of why I love it. Silent Hill games definitely had smart decision making aspects, but to me I think Siren is just more entertaining in that regard. Like on topic of the Shimura level, there's a shack where you can choose to press a button that causes an alarm to go off. But doing this causes the shibito you down to get back up. Even if it's a good distraction for the other shibito, it causes more to come to your location. If you choose not to do this and instead go forward with a basic objective, you will most likely make it through unscathed. You really need to keep track of how many bullets you use though, and the area is foggy so you might miss some shots with the rifle. Each level has its own different inventories and characters, so obviously not everyone is just handed a gun though. So some of the levels require strictly stealth. The stealth sections can be a little bit of a pain when it comes to their pace, but I personally am okay with them. They're still quite rough regardless. As mentioned before, I like the story of Siren a lot, mostly due to how non-linear it is, but also the mystery aspects really interest me a ton. Each of the characters are very interesting, getting to know their motives and why they're there is so fun to me. The game follows the aforementioned Kiyosuda, who came to the rural town Hanuda, to ghost hunt based on internet stories, but he runs into a ritual where a blind girl named Miyako is nearly sacrificed. Him interrupting the ritual ends up saving her life, and from that point on, the game goes all the fuck over the place in terms of lore and characters. Each of the plotlines come around full circle and it's so fucking good. The story does get a little confusing here and there, but I do overall really enjoy it. In a lot of ways, I can see why the game was criticized as much as it was on release. A big thing I really don't like about this game is how you get the true ending. If you just play the game as is, 
nothing interesting will happen. Even then, each of the endings you get are either really weird or just kind of bleak. Even the second ending of the game, which is the true ending, does end with the sound of helicopters implying the characters are saved, but that might just be set up for Siren 2 or Forbidden Siren 2, which was never released in the US because of the first game's poor sales in America. Which sucks because Siren 2 is unarguably the better game of the two. It improves on a lot of issues the first one has and is all around much easier to follow. But yeah, in regard to how weird the game's ending shit is, you have to do very specific things in levels where you most likely wouldn't even know about it without a walkthrough. Apparently Toyama made this intentionally because he wanted people to share things on the internet. I think that could totally work, but it's definitely strange. If you didn't have access to a walkthrough or something, you would probably not be able to get the best ending. No matter how annoyingly complex the first game is, I still love it a lot. It's very accessible too. It's available on both the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 shops, and usually goes for around 40 to 60 bucks on eBay. So with that being said, I recommend Siren. While it's rough around the edges, I definitely do think it's at least worth checking out if you don't mind the difficulty or batshit insane story. Out of the two horror games discussed in this video directed by Keichiro Toyama, I definitely think Siren is the better of the two. I know this might be a pretty weird opinion to some, but I just found myself more immersed in its story. Silent Hill's story is alright, but the story is probably the weakest thing about it. Most of the games that came out afterward have much better storylines. Siren's gameplay is a little janky, but that's not to say Silent Hill 1 isn't. I feel a little bit unsure on which of the two I prefer on that side of things, but Siren's mechanics are much more unique to me. Sightjacking is a very good way to deliver horror. I'm glad such an experimental idea came out as well as it did. Both games ended up turning into entire franchises, though the lesser known of the two is definitely Siren. Silent Hill has a total of 8 mainline titles at this moment, with some more coming, and Siren unfortunately only has 3 games. It'd be very cool to see a new Siren one day, but for the time being the series is seemingly dead, which sucks because it'd be very cool to see what a modern Siren game would look like. I know there's a manga series, but I don't think I'll ever read it, primarily because I don't know how well Siren could work in that medium. But, yeah, anyway, check both of these games out. Hello, uh, uh, this video is kind of an attempt to make something lengthy, and I have no idea how it'll come out, but I really hope you all liked it. I overworked myself for this, and now I have like 9 or maybe even more games to talk about. I'm hoping to at least try to make videos on the preceding 4, maybe even 5 Silent Hill titles during the upcoming 2 months. I was even thinking of doing a Shattered Memories video for December as a Christmas video, possibly. If I end up doing this, I don't know when I can do Downpour, considering it's a PS3 360 game, and I don't have a capture card. The Siren gameplay came from me recording clips from the PS4 version, and the Silent Hill gameplay was obviously emulation, which you probably could have figured out because of the fucking cursor on the screen. But yeah, I might have to save Downpour for the future, but first things first, I need to acquire a PS3 copy of the game. I own the 360 version, but I just feel the PS3 version is ideal. But anyway, this video is fun to make. I hope I can put out a few more videos during October, but... It'd be nice to try and complete at least half of the Silent Hill franchise during the month of October and November. But yeah, with that being said, thanks for watching this video. Please let me know what you thought in the comments, I'm trying my best with these. I really want to avoid summarizing the plots considering this is like two completely different games, but I kind of broke that rule with the Silent Hill 1 section. Regardless, I'm still trying. Anyway, thank you for watching. Have a good one.